And we're live. Hey guys, it's uh, Antonio from Deadly Analysis. Uh, this week, Noah is not with us. He has some family business to attend to. And uh, so we're going to be uh, having me sort of helm the ship as much as we're going to have a formal structure tonight. Um, tonight with us, we have Jim and Jonah. And we're going to be discussing the movie Seven with Brad Pitt, Morgan Freeman, Kevin Spacey, Gwyneth Paltrow, 1995. Um, one of my uh, personal selections for this channel and one of my favorite horror movies and uh, really looking forward to digging into it and getting into uh, counting our sins. So without further ado, and with no worse puns than that, we'll get to it. So. To start off, um, I guess we'll we'll start with the top level view of things. Um, I don't, you know, like I've said, this is one of my personal favorites, so I don't want to bias the discussion by going first. So let's throw it to, let's say, um, Jim first. Let's get your top level thoughts about the movie. What what do you like about the movie? Briefly, what do you dislike about the movie? Anything interesting that you think sets it apart from other typical work of the genre? Sure. So I really like this film. This is one of my my favorites as well. Um, I I have very few criticisms about this film, but I think we'll get into some of those as we as we go along. I think what really works about this is first of all uh, the direction by David Fincher. Fincher, this is quintessential Fincher in terms of style, mood, um, the, the use of the camera, framing of the shots, directing really fine actors, giving really good performances, especially Brad Pitt. This is one of those films where uh, in 1995, there was still a question about whether or not Brad Pitt was an actor or a pretty face. And this was, oh no, he's a, he's a fucking actor. Uh, Morgan Freeman is fantastic in it and surprise Kevin Spacey. I don't want this to be like cut out, but in this movie, as an actor and only as an actor and only, well, not only in this movie, Kevin Spacey is good. Um, <laughs> don't want that to be excised into Jim Hunter says Kevin Spacey is good. Uh, no, he's also, he is, he's, he's still an awful person. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I, I love a lot of aspects about this film. Um, Particularly, I think for me, the thing that the thing that I remember most about this film, aside from its technical aspects, which I sort of touched on a bit, is the themes and how this is uh, essentially a film about the heart versus the head, an emotional character um, in in the person of of Mills and the person of Brad Pitt's character, with a cold, calculating, uh, logical. Um, almost emotionless character until we get some bits of of who he is on an emotional level in the second act um in in the person of morgan freeman's character and how these two uh rival factions of the human uh, of 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 what makes us human go against each other in order to solve this this crime another thing that uh, we'll get to um John Doe's part in that uh, in that dichotomy uh, a little bit later on, but those that's the thing that thematically that's the thing that most stands out to me. Um, and so uh, I'll sort of throw it to Jonah. What are some of your top level, level thoughts, Jonah? Uh, before I before I keep talking away. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Oh, okay, so. Um... In generally speaking, I love any film, even if it's in just a segment of a film, where it's not so much this, it, or let me rephrase that, where it's about the process and procedure of what the police have to do to go, what is the, what, what is their role in solving the crime? I think Manhunter, for example, is a fantastic example where we get the police perspective the legislative, the procedure, what's happening on the law side. And we get a lot of that in this movie. It's not just so much about, oh, we're after a killer, but it's the process of the investigation, which I find so compelling. For just example, there's a scene in Prisoners where they're dusting an RV for Prince. 
it's one of my favorite scenes in the movie just because it's so, you know, it's the men in the white lab coats um, and the glove and there's something very um, sterile about that process that, that I gives the movie a very austere uh, at atmosphere. Um, the cinematography, I thought really helped tell the story more than any other um, aspect, just as much as the direction and the writing, the, the way the, the, the camera work and the lighting gave the film such, such depth and um, a sense of dread. Uh, on paper, I think that the plot is kind of thin and stupid. It's a killer, he's killing, he wants to kill one person each for, uh, one for each of the deadly sins. And so he kills a fat guy for, you know, the gluttony and if it kills a lawyer for greed, but the execution, so to speak, no pun intended, of the way it was done is masterful. It's just the pitch of the movie sounds kind of, uh, like I said, thin. There Later in this podcast, I want to get into another movie that was on my list that is too close I wanted to do a double feature for this podcast called The Calling with Susan Sarandon and Topher Grace and Donald Sutherland. The movie is about a serial killer who's religiously motivated, but seriously religiously motivated, not just, ah, seven deadly sins. There's one, you know, one person for each of them. Uh, th this guy has real conviction and a real sense of purpose. A uh, very religious person who thinks he's his murders are serving God. Um, so I'll get into that later in this podcast. But it's a very strong comparison. It's close enough to this movie that I feel like we, we should talk about it here. And I can briefly summarize the plot if um, if that's what it takes. Uh, it's kind of all I have to say. I hope I address that uh, concisely. Yeah, Jenna, that sounds, that's good stuff. Um, and uh, there's a couple elements that you touched on that, that would tie into my sort of top level take on it. Um, I agree with you that um, I, I guess to zoom even further back out, um, my favorite horror movies are movies that aren't necessarily that, that work on a level that isn't a horror movie as well as working on a level that is. So for example, you know, Alien is one of my favorite horror movies, but Alien also works as sort of a science fiction, um, you know, first contact creature feature with some questions about, you know, what does it mean to, you know, survive out on the edge of space and you know, what, what are the androids and how does that play into humanity and anthropocentrism? Um, and in the same vein, I think that this movie also works not just as a horror movie, but also works as a murder mystery, right? And that was kind of what you were touching on, Jonah, is that it's not, it's not necessarily a horror movie at core as much as it is a, a, police procedural that's turned into a horror movie through the way that it's it's trapped through the way through its trappings the way it's developed the way that it's framed um and of course the way that it ends the bottom line for it um and so in the same vein i really love murder mysteries you know i loved sherlock holmes as a kid i love the the struggle between passion and reason that is at the core of a lot of these murder mysteries as Jim alluded to earlier. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, as you said, Jonah, the way, one of the reasons that this movie works so well is because of its cinematography. Um, you know, the dark set pieces, the, the way that it's carefully crafted on a narrative level that's reflected in the way that it's carefully crafted on a visual level also. Um, and of course, I'm a sucker for any movie that that sort of realistically tries to take on some Judeo-Christian themes. Um, but actually, Jonah, one of the things that you brought up was how, you know, e the Judeo-Christian themes, while they're certainly present and while they're certainly um, worth talking about in the movie, 
they're a little bit on the light side and they mostly serve as a narrative framing device rather than being a deep core part of the movie's theology per se. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I wanted to bring up is, um, did any of you notice that you know, the two sources that they heavily lean on for, for inspiration are Dante's Inferno and uh, Milton's Paradise Lost? Other than um, The Merchant of Venice, those I think are the three uh, sources that get explicitly mentioned in the movie uh, connected to direct quotes from the, from the murderer. Um, and so did any of you guys notice that, uh, that in both of those sources, in Paradise Lost and in uh, uh, The Inferno, there is no seven deadly sins, or rather the seven deadly sins are not the seven deadly sins that we see in the movie. <laughs> Right. That's uh, Canterbury Tales is mentioned as well. Um, but yeah, there's a yeah, it's it's kind of cribbing Divine Comedy more than it's uh, exactly um, referencing it. I mean, I wasn't I wasn't troubled by that, but I, I certainly noticed that they were uh, they I, I think. Uh, Brad Pitt's character reads the cliff notes of uh, Divine Comedy and Canterbury Tales and and whatnot. Um, but and and I wonder to what degree the screenwriter read the cliff notes of uh, Divine Comedy and Canterbury Tales. Um, but at the same time, there is I it, this this inspired me to read Divine Can Divine Comedy uh, back in in '95 and and uh, I you know. It, it, I, I don't know. I think it, what's interesting to me about that is it's taking its um, inspiration from ancillary Christian texts rather than the Christian text, the the Bible. It's not. It's not saying, oh, there's this moment in the Bible that I want to, I, you know, I want to throw stones at people or 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 uh, you know, turn them into salt. It's I want to kill them with their sins. That it a sin that is talked in, in ways that are talked about in ancillary text rather than the original. Um, that I found interesting. And, and I, I'm sorry, Jenna, but I kind of have to disagree. I thought that the idea of killing people with their sins was a fantastic. I thought it worked. I thought it, if you had told me that in a pitch meeting, I would be like, all right, let's see where you go with this. I kind of, I'm, I'm in and, uh, uh, let's see what you have. Um, so I would have bought the, I would have bought that film based upon that concept, the concept of a serial killer who's killing people with the things that he believes they are sitting against the world with. All right, two things. One, um, I'm about to give major spoilers for The Calling, but I don't think it's going to ruin the movie. I think the movie's interesting enough that I could tell you what I'm about to tell you, and you'll still want to see it. Before I get there, though, I just want to address the issue of this movie being a horror film, because this is unlike other movies that we've discussed in this podcast. When when you used to tell me this is a horror movie, a question that I ask, whether uh, implicitly or explicitly, is who is being terrorized? Who Who is the horror directed at? And in a slasher film, quite often the audience is the victim. But here, I I, I don't who is, I feel like this, I would always call Seven a psychological thriller. I'd never thought of it as a horror film. I, um, Antonio, I see you rubbing your hands. Um, is your mouth watering or something for what I'm saying? I, yeah. oh, because I think that um, the police are the ones who are suffering the most in this film. We as an audience are pretty safe. And like it follows the audience feels like they're in danger in, in some sort of way. They walk away with an unease. But in this film, it has a nice little bow tie on it where everything is um, pretty much the horror ends when the credits come on, whereas other horror films, they continue. Now, a really dark and suffocating psychological thriller is, uh, again, Prisoners, but I would call that a horror movie. Also, it's about two children, two little, like, basically toddlers who are kidnapped. The police are impotent in finding um, any leads. So the father takes a suspect who he, who he believes is the kidnapper, and he kidnaps that person himself and starts torturing them, looking for answers. And that 
only makes things worse because the rabbits, you know, this hornet's nest just gets deeper and deeper. Um, and everybody in this movie is a prisoner, you know, like the mother is a prisoner in her own emotions and so on. I would say that movie is more of a horror film than this. Now, before you respond to that, I just want to quickly cover the calling because this dovetails and buttresses what um, Jim just said. So the calling is about a serial killer who's killing elderly senior citizens. Obviously, they're elderly people in their 60s. 70s and 80s and this is something that lisa fight would find very interesting because they're found like half decapitated these are brutal murders where their mouths are articulated so their lips are pressed together or their tongue is touching the of their mouth or their tongue is curled and they realize that if you put these mur these in order it's like they're saying something and one of the guys is pretty good with linguistics and he figures out what it says but not what it means and it turns out it's latin for something so they go to a priest who they believe is uh knows latin and he's like yeah this is a resurrection prayer and he starts pulls out the bible and he starts quoting this very esoteric very arcane prayer that is like was omitted from like original religious texts you know, this is like, you know, one of those, like, not even in the Bible prayers. And uh, so they figure out who this guy is, uh, and he's trying to resurrect his brother. And what he's doing is he's killing, he's going online, finding religious hospice patients who want to die, who are requesting death. And he administers the murders by saying, I'm, you're going to go to heaven, but you're also serving me. And so he's trying to kill enough people to fulfill the resurrection prayer, which is 12 people. So, I mean, that really takes, I mean, I'm not going to go into more than that, but um, so it's about trying to find him and stop him. And that is a guy who real, who isn't just like, Hey, kill somebody for each of their sins. I mean, this is a guy who really, really is desperate to kill people to resurrect his brother. And uh, it's just, I, I would say that uh, it's not, I wouldn't call it a horror movie, but it's definitely something that's parallel to seven. So, okay. So that's actually, you actually have touched on two really interesting points, Jonah. Um, and that is, uh, the first one is um, about the idea that this isn't exactly a horror movie, that the horror is directed in an unusual way that's not typical of most um, horror movies. Um, and so that's the first thing I want to discuss is, um, there's kind of a question of who's the protagonist here exactly. Um, and where, wh what's the narrative anchoring of this movie? Where is it, where is it framed narratively and aimed narratively? Um, and I want to sort of provocatively suggest that, um, the, the protagonist in this movie is probably probably is the morgan freeman character um william um but i want to provocatively suggest that the way that the movie is narratively anchored is actually very is actually in a way that's very um sympathetic to or maybe even evocative of the john doe murderer character um and so so there's there's sort of an ambiguity in the way that the movie is shot the movie is kind of shot to make us think more sympathetically toward the John Doe character, you know, the, the, and, and obviously the John Doe character is aware of this and wants to sort of play on our sympathies um, in that, you know, he, he carefully selects people who are sort of by nature unsympathetic or, or arguably deserving of the punishment that he visits upon them. Right. And he, he doesn't, he doesn't just concoct this. It's not just, it, 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 repeatedly, he makes the point that it's this isn't just an insane plan that he has, right? It is, isn't just you know his his being crazy. It's his you know carrying out a a sort of a divine mission, you know, a divine performance art, if you will, to use his explicit um, framing. And the movie sort of agrees with that framing in the way that it that it that it depicts the ordering of events and the way that that um, things progress. Because of course, by the end. 
um, you know, spoiler alert, uh, you know, David ends up shooting the John Doe character and thus the the police, the investigation is co-opted into the, into John Doe's plan. And so I think the movie is definitely shot to make you at least feel somewhat sympathetic toward um, David's character when he shoots John Doe. Like we understand why he's doing it. We're not surprised terribly that he does it. Um, and so by the fact that we feel sympathy for the David for David when he shoots John Doe, we're sort of seduced in that moment into John Doe's into agreeing with John Doe's framing of events. Right? If we agree that it's a good idea to kill John Doe, then in some sense we're agreeing that the way John Doe felt like events should proceed is the right way that to proceed. Right? Yeah. Well. Um, I, I don't buy that. Do you believe that John Doe was actually envious of David, though? I mean, I do. I don't buy that. I think that I think that that was just a lie to get him to wrath, basically, from David. But I don't think. Yes. And that's and that's actually this, the second point that you brought up was um, how, it, you know, in the calling, there's this like sort of very specific ritual that's laid out that the protagonist is trying to hew to in order to achieve his final goal. And there's, while there's a lot of elaborate stuff that the John Doe character does in Seven, toward the end, there's an, there's sort of an implication that this may be more improvised than we had initially thought. And so actually one of the questions that I wanted to put to you guys is, do you think that, that the circle is completed? Do you think that, the, that John Doe actually completed his plan by getting himself shot? Um, because one of the one of the key elements of, of John Doe's plan is that everyone dies, right? They die in order to performance art Edley show their sin, right? Well, David doesn't die at the end, right? And he, may, for all we know, he may just get life in prison or what have you. For I think he's going to be found innocent, you know, like exactly, I think it's, exactly. or he may may even be found to be a crime of passion, and so. So there's a real question of, you know, let's say that he is Wrath. Does that mean that Wrath just walks away in John Doe's conception? Or is John Doe's plan failing because Wrath didn't end up dying in some ironic way at the end? Do you see what I'm saying? Um, and so actually, Jim, what's your take on all this? You've been quite quiet. And I'd like to get your, your take on whether you think uh, John Doe actually succeeded. And how do we know? Um, I think that he succeeded... <sighs> Like I, I, for Morgan Freeman's character, for Somerset, he did succeed because uh, Somerset says explicitly, if you kill him, he wins. John Doe is trying to show that our sins and the sinful nature of the world is the thing that is eventually going to bring it down. He references specifically Sodom and Gomorrah in the backseat of that uh of, of the car as in his logic, um, Sodom and Gomorrah's sins um, were the thing, were the reason why destruction was visited upon them. And, you know, it may be that he, that uh, Mills gets off. Uh, it may be that he only has life in prison, but I mean, let's not, let's not kid ourselves. His life is ruined at the end of this movie. His, his wife is dead. Um, with an unborn child that he didn't know even existed. Uh, he is clearly going to face the wrath of the criminal justice system. Um, his uh, idealism, which he exhibits in the bar, no longer has any moorings on which it can on which he can build the rest of his his life. Uh, cynicism and apathy. I, I think one of the key themes is that that conversation in the bar where uh, Morgan Freeman's character, uh, Somerset, talks about um, how he, he realizes that apathy is understandable. Um, and then Mills says something along the lines of, well, you're no better. And he's like, I know I'm no better. I I recognize apathy being understand understandable, and I hate myself for it. He doesn't say exactly that. I'm I'm sort of paraphrasing, but he dislikes his own penchant for apathy in a what everybody in this film agrees is a shitty world, and 
so I, I, I just, I think the question is a little like, uh, let's not, let's not downplay the degree to which Mills is totally ruined by the end of this film and the degree to which his life and the things that he built his life on no longer have any moorings. Um, the, that's really important. So wrath might have not have caused physical death for Mills, but it certainly has caused an emotional and psychic death for Mills. Um, and, and that, I think that's the central point for me. Um, and let, let me go a little bit further. Um, for, I talked in my top level comments about how for me this film is is sort of a battle between heart and head, uh, a battle between an emotional centric character and a, a logic centric character. And what's interesting is that Doe is right in the middle. You see in the back of the car how he talks with such disdain about the the overweight man and and the uh, the prostitute and the lawyer. He he talks with real disgust and disdain about about these people, and yet his plan is so methodical and logical, and uh, it's it's admirably well thought out, even though it's disgusting and awful. Um, so for me, Doe exists as a middle ground between these two characters and Doe's eventual death is the film ironically saying that emotion wins out uh, in this heart head battle. And yet that still does not lead us toward a better, uh, a better more um, caring and forgiving and welcoming place to live. Uh, so that's, I, I, I sort of roundabout answered your question, Antonio, partially because, uh, because I think that, I think we might see this film in, in slightly, we see this film, I think from two different vantage points. Um, and, uh, and in that sense, uh, so I was, I was basically answering with my vantage point. So I'm going to just add that. In the same way that we, I first saw this movie when it came out, it was in theaters, and I watched this movie first few times I saw it anyway. The same way I would watch a Final Destination movie or Friday the Thirteenth movie, where every murder was, I was like, oh wait, can't wait for the next one, can't wait to see how they're gonna die. It kind of didn't make it, it, it made it entertaining, which I think is either the intent or a complete misunderstanding either that's exactly what fincher wanted or i completely misunderstood the film because i didn't feel the dread i thought that the deaths were creative and that they're um it didn't evoke horror in the way that i think it was intended to by the way i just want to say that the scariest thing i think Part of the movie for me was the detective, detective, detective scene when he turns himself in. The way he screams detective. I mean, I don't deal with being, I don't deal with loud voices well. And that part gets me every time. I mean, that was, that for me, that is the most chilling um, part of the movie. And it's not something that's visual. It's completely auditory. Um, so, just, okay. I don't, I mean, for me, the, all of the, the deaths were were gross. Like this is this is body horror from in a lot of ways for me because we've got the gluttony death, which I think is is shot. Uh, you know that that first reveal of the guy sort of lying down in in the spaghetti that that kind of up angle uh, low angle um, shot. Um, the the sloth when he wakes up um, that was. That was a jump scare well done. Um, I thought the I, it seemed like they really couldn't show some of the uh, the lust killing um, in in a way that I think Fincher might have uh, might have wanted to. But uh, that the idea of that imagining somebody being um, uh, penetrated uh, with that it was uh, was pretty gross. So in in that sense, I think there's a lot of if you're if you're prone to being grossed out, um, maybe not you, Jonah, but perhaps our listeners, if you're prone to being grossed out, this has plenty for you there. 
Yeah, and honestly, um, I feel like that that affects where the movie pivots in a narrative sense quite a bit. Um, I would say that uh, that you know you, you ask yourself what what is the point of making a movie about a serial killer who kills based on seven deadly sins? Well, it depends on how you present it, right? But in this particular case, the way it's presented is you see a very creative murder done in, immediately, and then it becomes apparent by the second murder that this is going to be a, you know, that there's going to be a chain of murders with a particular theme to them, right? Um, but they're not all going to be the same kind of murder. They're going to be radically different sorts, but, but uh, sort of oriented around a common theme. And so... Um, in many ways, the pivot point of the movie is really John Doe in many, many different ways in that um, we are pruriently watching his performance art. You know, this is sort of a meta commentary from David Fincher, I, I would argue, is, you know, we are we are pruriently watching performance art of people dying and we know more people are going to die but we don't know exactly how we just know the sort of general theme and we want to see as jonah said you know we we want to see you know how how's the next person going to die you know this person died in a really crazy way what what's the how, how is he going to tie in you know pride to how he kills the next person right that's what we as as a viewer are watching and thinking to ourselves you know oh well we've got you know one two three four ticked down that means that there's only three kinds of you know uh, sin left that he could be killing people over, and so then our mind immediately begins to work on that problem, right? We start envisioning, you know, okay, what's he? Wh what could he possibly be cooking up for the next hapless victim? Um, and so, so it kind of pivots on on us being the the audience for his performance art, uh, as he explicitly, of course, says in the movie. And then, as you pointed out. Jim, um, he's the pivot point of the movie as well in terms of he's the exact balance between emotion and reason. You know, the Morgan Freeman character, William, representing reason, the Brad Pitt character representing emotion, and then you have the John Doe character in the middle who has the reason, the careful, methodical, cold planning of the Morgan Freeman character with the raw, um, you know, uh, purity-driven... Uh, obsessive nature, yeah, of, of emotion that you see in the Mills character. Yeah, I think that's that's the that's the important point for me. Like that that dichotomy is what really drives me on. I'm I'm really I'm interested in your your you you framed it as a provocative thesis that uh, that Doe is the the protagonist of the film structurally. Like that's you know that you're right in identifying Somerset as the protagonist of the film. Um, I, you know, I wonder, see, this is why I find some horror movies to be um, somewhat unethical because they are relying upon our desire to watch bad things happen to people. Uh, they're relying upon for their suspense and for their their emotional effect. They're relying upon our bloodlust, and I always find that to be somewhat uncomfortable. So as you're going through this this uh, interpretation of the film, it's making me dislike it um, a little bit more because I, you know, I attach to a completely different theme, and I'm not. I'm hoping that they're. I know that there's going to be an inevitable countdown of the seven sins, but what I'm more interested in is the interplay between these characters. That's why I like the movie more than I can't wait to see how Pride dies, uh, uh, which, by the way, the way Pride died was really fucking good. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I, I that's... In a way, I, I find myself uncomfortable with the interpretation of of Doe as the protagonist um, because that relies upon um, the film wanting me to to have that that bloodlust of Doe uh, to identify with that character in that way, which I I would prefer not to, and and I would find it unethical to identify with that character in that way. Uh, we can go to uh, to another 
points unless you want to pick up on something there. Yeah, actually, I was going to I was going to ask you, you know, yes, it is uncomfortable that we identify with the John Doe character. Um, but wouldn't you say that part of the theme of this movie is precisely that that um, our vigilante impulses are to some extent inextricable and that and that to some extent it's a matter of perspective as to whether you know someone gets their is if someone is getting their just desserts we sympathize inherently if we feel that someone is getting their just desserts and so the the point of this movie is very elaborately to to suggest from the john doe character's point of view that you know the people he killed were all getting their just desserts and the the twist ending is that maybe maybe we're not so far away from that ourselves we feel that the John Doe character gets his just desserts in the same kind of arbitrary, uh, as you say, maybe bloodlust uh, seeking um, manner that he dispatches his victims. Right. I mean, one of the things to sort of crystallize that question is, would you have shot John Doe? Were you Mills? Uh, if you're in that situation, you just found out that your wife's head was in a box uh, we actually had a question a long time ago in the chat about whether what was in the blocks box. It's Gwyneth Paltrow's head. Spoiler alert. Um, but I, I, I guess the question is: Is would you have shot John Doe if you found out that your wife's head was in a box over there, and that this is the man who put it there? Would you have done it? Um, I, I have wrestled back and forth over that question but i would like to believe that i wouldn't i don't know that i don't know if that is that is one of those uh gee i i would never have fallen for the milgram experiment kind of uh claims like yeah i would have defied the authority i would have stopped electrocuting that guy or like that sort of you know, idealized vision of myself that knows that I have a fixed moral, that believes that I have a fixed moral compass, or is that, you know- Well, you know, would, so would, Somers, would Somerset have, like that would have been a really good end, ending is that if it was Somerset's head, the head of so someone that Somerset was, because Somerset is like the voice of reason in this movie, and he's the one who's most, level-headed no pun intended but what if it was him you know what he have, that, i think that is like an alternate ending question yeah and i actually that's a, it's good that you ask that because um that lets me set up my other uh provocative thesis for the movie uh so so the first provocative thesis to the movie is that is that the john doe character is the protagonist in a sense because he represents the midpoint between emotion and reason and also because um, he's the performance artist whose whose performance drives our interest in the movie to begin with, basically. Um, and so the other the, the the way to sort of flip that on its head is to view Somerset, is to view William Somerset as the as the protagonist um, from a slightly different perspective, where um, where it, as as uh, Jim suggested, it's sort of a war between um, reason and emotion. And we're we're cued throughout the movie that various um, various surrenders to emotion are are unwise and lead us to down, down a bad road, and that the movie is actually about a competing com competing worldviews with with uh, Somerset representing the moderate worldview in between Mills, who is the hopeless idealist, and Doe, who is the cynic, right? So Doe, Doe believes that the world is, um, you know, a, is, is a dark and sinful place that people deserve to be punished for their sins um, and that we have become, we've, we, it's such a bad place that we're deadened to sin and that's why we're not outraged at the state of the world. And that um, the, way that we, the way that we can try to recapture what, what we want to see, the good that we want to see in the world is through violence. You know, we go out and we kill the people who deserve sin who deserve to be punished for the sin, right? And then Mills, on the other hand, is the hopeless idealist who, you know, thinks that there's good and that, and that you know, believing in the goodness of people at the end of the day can carry you through to, you know, a satisfactory conclusion. 
and uh, and Somerset represents the moderate perspective, sort of in between these two, where he, uh, you know, it, it, which is encapsulated in the last line of the movie, where he, you know he says the world the world is a fine place and worth fighting for, and he says, well, I believe in the second part, so the world is not a fine place, but the world is worth fighting for, and so that's the dichotomy that that Somerset straddles is he believes the world is not a fine place, so it, he's in the John Doe camp there. But he believes the world is worth fighting for, and he's in the Mills camp there. And it's only through believing that the world is not a fine place. It's only through seeing the depravity of the world realistically that you can actually fight for the good aspects of the world, for for the aspects of the world that are that are worth promoting uh, in a just fashion. Um, and Mills fails because through his optimism, he becomes swayed by emotion. And there's actually a number of of um, symbolic cues that set up this idea that Mills is going to miss the, the big picture, uh, up to and including a really subtle scene where Gwyneth Paltrow um, tells him to pick the dirt out of his eye. <laughs> like, even, even as subtle as that, it's a cue that he's going to be blind to something, that he's going to be blinded by something and miss the big picture. Um, whereas Somerset sees the big picture, and that's why as soon as he sees what's in the box, he says, drop your gun, Bells. Wait, he says John Doe has the upper hand. Yes, and that's uh, I. I think that was that was a chilling moment, effectively in the film. Yeah, I like your like. Whereas I put this this triangle into you know Mills and Somerset and their uh, reliance upon emotion and and um and reason, you've created another triangle, sort of flipping everything uh, around where. Uh, there's the cynic and the idealist, which I think is equally as compelling. Um, but I can you can you explain more? Like I didn't fully buy the argument that uh, Doe is the cynic. Uh, can you explain that argument a little bit more? Because I have questions about it, and I just want to give you an open-ended question first, and then I'll kind of yeah, pick sure. up that idea for uh, a second. The reason that that uh, that that Doe strikes me as the cynical personality here is um, is I guess twofold. The first is that you know he's the person who is willing to resort to violence as a means of of achieving his ends. Sure, and that inherently sort of denotes a much more cynical state about about the propriety of manipulating the world around you than something that's expressed by Mills or, or Somerset. Um, and so, so that's, that's, that's one aspect in which, in which Doe is, is cynical about the world around him. Um, and in the, se the second is that he um, believes that the world is inured to normal mechanisms of promoting justice or, or a better message. You know, uh, he, he's cynical in the sense that he believes that only feeding people their sins back to them in a violent and pro deliberately provocative way is going to constitute a message that people are capable of hearing. That if he were to simply preach uh, the message that he wants to say verbally, that no one would listen to him, that it would completely fall on dead ears. And so in that sense, he's also very cynical about the world around him in a way that I don't think you can say is true of somebody like a police officer. A police officer inherently is, is a believer in the power of the status quo to enforce certain norms. I would disagree with that. I, completely, but okay, go ahead, no, Jenna. No, I was just going to say the last sentence about the police officer being the status quo. I mean, ideally, yes, but in reality, no. And I think that, like, every buddy cop movie or any cop movie that features more than one officer you got like you have the idealist and then you have the realist who's also the bad cop or at least the one who's morally ambiguous so um i wouldn't say that the cop is implicitly uh the you know the um the, the voice of reason and truth and all things good. Yeah, I, I, I'm sort of, I'm agreeing with you a little bit, Jonah, because I think that a lot of, except for the penchant toward violence, Antonio, 
um, which exists only in Doe and then to some degree in Mills. Um, aside from the pension of violence, I think everything you said about Doe exists in Somerset as well. He's also, remember, an anti-natalist. He, uh, he, he tells that story about being close to marriage uh, with that one woman and uh, that they got pregnant and he convinced her to have an abortion uh, very specifically because you couldn't raise a, a, a child in a world like this. Um, that he is just as detached and just as as angry at it. And I think the only difference between the two of them is Doe perversely believes that the world can be saved as a result of his performance art. Somerset has given up on that all altogether. He has said that most of the time, all we do is collect facts just in case they might be uh, needed for a trial one day. Uh, he, he doesn't believe in the sanctity of his work. He doesn't believe in the retributive factor of justice uh, or the restorative factor of justice, I should say. Uh, he doesn't believe that anything that he is doing or any pursuit to which he can apply himself will have any discernible good. And all of that combined makes me think that he is much closer to Doe much closer to being a cynic than Doe is, because I think Doe believes that after this this grand plan is realized, that people will understand the degree to which their sins are infecting the planet, and blah 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 blah. Like that, like that's Doe's perverse and 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 twisted logic for executing this plan in the first place. Somerset has given up on any sort of restorative. Um, ideology as it relates to the world. His only restorative, uh, his only belief in the restoration of the world comes in that very, you cited it yourself, a very existential line, which is the world is worth fighting for even though it is shit. And so I think that is, that is just as cynical as anything that that Doe has said. So I, in in the triangle that you've built, I'm kind of like, pushing Somerset over the, to the doe, uh, the doe end of that spectrum. Maybe it's a, not an even equilateral triangle the way we were, uh, we were envisioning it before, or at least in my conception of the film, I should say, I should probably qualify this as saying, no, yeah, this is just what I think. No, that, that's actually really, a really interesting, uh, a really interesting perspective. And I think you may be correct that that the lesson of the film, the, you know, it, it may be, it may not be that that uh, Somerset is, you know, a on a balance point in between two poles, so much as simply that uh, Mills and Doe both reflect some aspect of flawed idealism, and Somerset represents the realism that keeps you detached enough to be alive at the end of the day. Um, that's, I certainly can see that that as a completely valid interpretation of the film. And indeed, it does seem that the film takes this sort of nihilistic um, perspective of, you know, the, the world is worth or, or perhaps existential would be, as you put it, the better the better way to, to say it, you know, that the world is, uh, you know, worth fighting for. It's not a place where it's OK to go and kill people to remind them of their sins. But at the same time, um, if you believe that things are going to be pure and turn out well for you, you're just setting yourself up for judgment. Yeah, you're setting yourself up for judgment and disappointment. Um, I, you know, I, I think at this point, it's, it's interesting to consider the Gwyneth Paltrow character and what is causing her to uh, doubt uh, having a child, what is causing her to like, what is, how does she fit in, in this cynic cynicism versus idealism, um, logic versus emotions, these logic versus emotion and cynicism versus idealism spectrums that we have here, because she seems to me, I, you know, I think one of my complaints about the film is how clunky that character is introduced and how she doesn't really have that much of a role in the main thematic conflicts that are going on here. And yet I also 
feel like Fincher is too good of a filmmaker to just throw this character in just to be a, a, a dead girl in a refrigerator. Like there's, she's got to fit in these conflicts in ways that I'm not seeing. And I, I guess I, as we're talking about these two spectrums and these two, these two thematic conflicts, let's throw her into the mix and see, see where she, she falls. I'm not totally sure where to place her. Uh, in part because I don't think that character is very well developed, but I, I, I'll throw, throw that out to you guys and see what you guys think, well, Jonah. I, I want to say, and this doesn't really address what you just said, but um, I'm going to give another motive for all of um, John, for John Doe uh, that I think is maybe garbage, but it might be compelling rather than forgetting the whole seven deadly sins. That's just, sort of the curtain. This is a movie about how to turn an idealist into a cynic. And so that's how you do it. You have to kill seven people and have them kill you because he killed his wife. And then Mills is going to be a cynic. He, there's no way he can see good in the world at the end of this movie. So John Doe found the perfect idealist, turned him into a cynic, mission complete. Like I said, it could be a shit idea, but, um, or not probably a should idea no, but just something to uh, chew on and spit out um I think I'll read a, a comment from from one of our frequent chatters who's who's uh, jumping into the Gwyneth Paltrow what is Gwyneth Paltrow Gwyneth Paltrow represents the goodness or light or or perfection who also hates society um, and yeah uh, so I think that's an interesting, interesting uh, comment to throw in there, uh, similar to, you know, uh, that she is actually the the most idealistic, which would fit into your interpretation, Jonah, that she's the one that then has to die in order to turn, like she can't be turned into a cynic, uh, according to this commenter's uh, interpretation, kind of trying to fit that into uh, fit that into yours. I mean, to my mind, though, she has too much. She has too many questions about whether or not she has a. She has to have a child. She wants to have a child. She has too many questions about that. She goes to Somerset because she's troubled by this, and it seems to me like a good, a good, perfect idealist would just be like, "Oh, we're having a baby. This is so awesome. We get more of us. This will be great." When. Uh, you know, all of the other characters in this film would be like, oh, you're having a baby? Fuck. That sucks. And so I, I, I guess that, um, that, that would be my, my, yeah, that's why I'm, I'm still questioning where she fucking fits into this movie. Uh, because it doesn't, doesn't really, it, it, no interpretation really washes for me, unfortunately. I say with apologies to our wonderful commenter. Uh, Antonio, do you want to pick up this uh, who the fuck is Gwyneth Paltrow in this movie? Yeah, um, actually, one of the things that uh, I always like to do with pretty much every artistic endeavor is to play uh, what's in a name at some point. I generally think that names are not uh, chosen accidentally in screenplays for the most part, and that they can often reveal some inspiration that... that uh, that can elucidate thornier points in the movie. So, uh, you know, to give to give some evidence that that this isn't just a crackpot theory for this particular movie, let's consider the names of the protagonists, right? So, um, the first one is David, of course, David Mills, right? And David, who, who's David as a as a biblical character? Because obviously we have Judeo Christian themes here, right? And so David is, you know, the righteous king, but he's also a murderer. Right. And this is an interesting, interesting twist that sounds like it can't possibly be irrelevant to our consideration here. Right. So he's the righteous king who is hot headed and, you know, passionate about about, you know, building the kingdom of God. But but his passion is ultimately a tragic flaw that leads him to commit murder. And so he is a he is a man of blood. And for this reason, he's not given this sanction by God ultimately to build the temple. The temple cannot be built by someone who has blood on his hands. And David, as a man of war and as a murderer, is not is disqualified by by doing this. So that's the first 
kind of interesting uh, uh, notion that we have here as far as the nomenclature. Then we go to um, William, right, at Somerset. And William, uh, in this case, means um, resolute, a resolute protector is the, is the origin of the name. And in this case, William, again, is the, very much this sort of character in the movie. He is someone of, of will. He is someone of resolution. And he is the, he is the ca only character who is able to remain sufficiently unmoved by events that he ends the movie in largely the same ideological and psychological condition that he started the movie. Um, and so, and then of course, John means um, the grace of God or favorite of God. And of course, John Doe in this case is a religious fanatic who believes that he is enacting God's plan um, and you know through God's work, his mysterious grace. So there's an argument that there's a, uh, that, that uh, John Doe is also part of the nomenclature in this movie. And so then that brings us to William's, or, or sorry, uh, David's wife, who's Tracy. And Tracy uh, is a Celtic, for, comes from a Celtic word, and it means fighter. And that uh, uh, runs up against a an interpretive kind of hurdle because, you know, thus far, the names all seem to fit with their roles in the movie. You know, John plays the role of the religious fanatic, William plays the role of the resolute protector, and uh, David plays the role of the hot-headed righteous king, basically. You know, the, the the righteous man who's also a murderer. But if Tracy's a fighter, how do we? How exactly do we fit that into our conception of the movie? Does that mean that she is the ultra idealist and therefore has to be knocked off the top, or does the fact that she's a fighter imply that she's lower down on the totem pole than? than David, where she's, you know, she occupies a more ambiguous spot in the story. I have a question. Go, go, all right, go ahead. Go ahead, yeah, 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 it's all you. This is quick, this is quick. This is something I didn't want to bring up, because it's a very stupid question, so I'm, I'm uh, glad that Noah brought this up. We know also, we, well, no, um, Antonio, You'd also probably want to do an analysis of the of Mills and Somerset too, if you're going to do their first name and last name. But John Doe is the name police give to an unknown. And a problem I have with this movie is is his actual name John Doe, or is that just he's never identified? Uh, he assumes an identity, uh, John Doe. Um, he. Uh, Basically, there's there's a little expository line by Arlie Ermey's character that says uh, we we can't find any trace of him before five years ago when he shows up as John Doe, and so in that sense, um, he that's that's how they sort of yada yada that plot point away. Um, but, because if his name is actual, if if his name is John Doe that would seriously ruin the movie for me. It's the same bullshit. Like when you have a sniper named John shooter or something, you know, or, you know, or like, you know, that joke in Seinfeld about the librarian cops name is Bookman, you know, like it's, it's, it's too on the nose for it to, to mean anything. Yeah. Well, and, I think that go ahead and Antonio. Yeah. In a lot of, in a lot of, um, you know, religious, uh, not only fiction, but also uh, you know, not only religious myth, but also religious practice. Um, there's a deep tradition across a lot of different faiths of you know giving your name up in order to take up a new name for that represents a divine mission. Um, and I think that you can argue pretty strongly that that's what John Doe is doing in this particular movie. You know, as as uh, Jim pointed out. Arlie Ermey's character at one point says, you know, John Doe shows up five years ago fairly abruptly. And um, and indeed, when he's asked about who he is and what he's what he's about, uh, John Doe explicitly says who I am is not important. You know, I'm not my identity isn't important. It's my mission that's important. Right. And and the fact that he's named John Doe is exactly emblematic of this belief that he has that his identity is, is insignificant. He deliberately takes a name that, that connotes anonymity 
in order to underline the fact that it's not about him, it's about the message that he's trying to send. Right. And that makes a lot of sense within the, the mythology and within the, the internal logic of that character. Um, as he's building this, as you, I think, correctly called it performance art piece, um, he's building this without his own identity attached to it um, in a very, uh, yeah, in a, in a sense that who he is isn't important. What he does is the, uh, we've argued before, turning a cynic into an idealist, or um, I think his internal logic is that people will, will see the error of their ways. And he, in his own mind, becomes a kind of Christ figure because he dies for his own. He dies as a result of his own sins um, for the sins of others, for that other, so that others will see uh, his, his sacrifice as, as important and a, a redeeming factor in their own lives. And I think he also, uh, he says specifically that he invites copycats so that others will will follow in his footsteps and and purge the world of the sinners. This is the internal logic of his character, um, not certainly not my own. <laughs> so so do you guys? And just to to get a, I guess a formal statement on it, do do you guys feel that um, Doe viewed himself as envy from the beginning, like that he that as he was planning out his series of murders, he realized that he was going to be taking the role of envy or do you think that this was something that he uh hit upon later in the process after he had already perhaps killed a couple of people um or begun the, that process well uh, this was a question in the chat as well there were some people who were suggesting that uh that doe just sort of faked envy in order to make his whole thing his old plan work at the end um I don't know. It's it's almost too poetic for it to uh, for it to not have been planned. But I, you know, let's let us assume that he is this cynical character, which I think we've established fairly well. And I, I think there's there's a lot that that recommends that interpretation of him. He's a cynical character in a world that is portrayed as unabashedly shitty. Um, that there's no redemptive value in anything, essentially, except in his um, radical religious uh, point of view. And I can imagine within the psychology of that character wanting it all to just be simple, wanting it all to just be easy, wanting it all to uh, kind of just go away and be in a picket fence um a, a picket fence life a a, a stepford level kind of li life that that is devoid of having the the gift of sight so to speak uh or the curse of sight let's 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 sort of turn that around that he believes that his own um that that his ability to see the sin of everything around him, the cesspool of New York City, that that is both a, a gift of sight, but also a curse, something that weighs upon him. And so he envies the uh, the 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 normal life, which he views uh, Mills and uh, Brad Pitt's character as having a light, a wife. With a child, a perfect uh, a child on the way, um, a comfortable though vibrating home, um, that kind of that sense of idealism, I can imagine him actually envying that. Um, I can imagine that as he gets to know his pursuers, uh, which he he he's clearly doing in that that stairwell scene. Um, I can imagine him becoming envious of that life. So yeah, I, I think that he does become envy to some degree. So you think that that's a mantle that he sort of takes on over time rather than something that he planned out for himself from the beginning? Uh, 
I think he always had a streak of envy, but he didn't have an object of his envy until he met Mills. Uh, but I think he, I can imagine a cynical um, and, and put upon person as he believes himself to be uh, wanting it all to just go away, wanting to stop seeing all these sinful fat, horror people and and just live a normal life where you don't have to see how awful everybody is um so i think he always had a sense of envy but it wasn't until he saw he got to know mills's life that that mills became the object of his envy and and therefore mills became the person upon whom he he uh um he, 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 the object of his envy. I've said that several times. Um, one comment that that happened early, way earlier in the chat that I thought was interesting that was that um, uh, John Doe's sin was always was never envy. It was always wrath because he was angry at how shitty the world was. Um, and that I thought that was an interesting reading as well. That that and I think I, I think one can make the argument that he was always wrath. He was. He was not in fact envy, but um, for my own my own answer to that question is is as I've said, uh, Jonah. Do you want to shout at that? Yeah, I, I'm going to disagree. He, like Kanye, thinks himself as a genius, and he keeps telling people how smart he is and how they'll be writing about him in books. And I mean, no, you wouldn't say that um, if it if he hadn't planned this out. I think that envy was. <clears throat> up, and I'm going to use, I'm not trying to make a pun here, but it's a good one, is a box that he could put anything in, no matter who his pursuers were, no matter if Somerset was the one, he could find anything to be envious of, to, to just lie. I don't think he's actually envious. I think that the plan was um, the cop would become wrath. So envy is... Uh, just a lie that he could apply to anybody. He could find anything about anybody to be envious of. It's not necessarily a wife and a beautiful home. It could be a cushy job. It could be a nice car. Um, it could be, a, you know, a, a, you know, a big bank account. It doesn't matter what it is. So I think that, and this was all part of his, his master plan. Um, if, he was making it up as he was going along. It would seriously weaken his character. I mean, let's say that he, there was no envy. He killed envy for someone else. Then he killed for wrath. And then what happens? The, the movie would have fallen apart. He wouldn't have driven them out into the field. I mean, he just would become, would return himself in at the end and just say, I, I'm done. I did my seven. I have, nothing, I have nothing else to live for. I mean, that was his life's mission. It was like he spent all that time filling notebooks with his rants as if he wanted them to be read. Like, he was, if you go back far enough, he spent... He started um, assembling his, this idea long before uh, Gluttony turned up. He needed those books to be found. For them to understand him so uh i think that yeah i think that envy was planned all along and it was just a lie i don't think that envy emerged as a result of uh this mission he was on that's actually a really interesting uh wrinkle jonah because i'm i'm inclined to agree with you that that you know the character is incredibly methodical and that kind of stretches credulity that he would sort of embark on this kind of elaborate snuff spree and not have the end in mind not begin with the end in mind so it definitely i think makes sense that he that he sort of visualized himself in the spot of envy before even really knowing how that was going to end up playing out in the end and um and that actually is a pretty cool that actually adds a really cool uh sort of interpretation to the villainy of the john doe character if you think about it because what that means is that that what the movie's trying to tell us is when you are this kind of grandiose personality, when you're this kind of personality who who sees himself on a mission 
and you know is is kind of he views himself John Doe if he viewed him if he was planning to die as from wrath from the very beginning then inherently he has to view himself as basically a tragic figure you know a figure who is destined to put in all this work and make this grand point that ends in his martyrdom basically right you know his death as a witness to the truth of his cause right um and and so what that actually exposes him as is it is it, it exposes the hypocrisy and sort of the venality of of that kind of grandiosity because any stick would have been good enough you know anybody that he would have been pursuing he would have been trying to bend into wrath and so he would have found a reason to for his tragic character to be envious of whomever he had ended up in conflict with such that he could then set up that that end game that he was always planning to uh to do from the beginning yeah i i mean my argument is though that the that he was already envious of the world he was already envious of not having to see what he saw as the world's degradation um and so i i guess i'm i'm kind of on a different different tack different uh different idea because i i think that he was always envious of of people who are able to walk around and not see the fat guy as disgusting um, which he viscerally does. Um, I think one of the things we get, one of the good things about Kevin Spacey's performance, I hate complimenting him. Uh, one of the good things about Kevin Spacey's performance is he gets truly disgusted when he talks about uh, his his victims. And he said, only in a world this, quote, he only, only in a world this shitty could you look at these people as innocent? And I think that weighs on you it would weigh on somebody and to be able to be blind to that, I think is what he is envious of. Okay. I believe you. Okay. I, I believe that when he's ranting in the back of the car, I, I, I think he's real. I think I, I actually believe that he thinks those things, but when he talks about envy, I didn't buy it for a second. He's like, Oh, your beautiful wife. I mean, it was good acting in that it's sm you could smell the bullshit through the screen. It didn't feel real. It didn't seem sincere at all. It didn't. It wasn't the same tone or attitude or affect that he had in the back of the car. He was almost like winking at the camera, saying, "Ah, eh, it's envy. It's envy." It wasn't disgust or. It, it didn't sound envious, I should say. He was like begging to be shot. Um, it was more psychotic than um, genuine. But so I don't, you know what I'm saying? I don't. It, I know what you're saying. I just don't, uh, <laughs> I don't agree. share the same interpretation. Uh, yeah, I mean, I know what you're saying. And it makes it makes sense within that interpretation. That, yeah, I'm, I'm cool with that being a, uh, uh, your interpretation. It's, Mine is a little different. Mine is, I think, I, you know, I'm building more of a backstory to this character than perhaps maybe I'm building too much of a backstory into the character. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but that's what we do on this channel. So, fuck it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, and I think that's... Uh, that's let's, let's talk a little bit, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about, um, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of the conversation has revolved around you know what kind of what kind of world is being portrayed here and what what are the takes that people have on the world that's being portrayed and so um one of the things that i think this movie does really well is it has a great sense of place it doesn't necessarily place itself in a specific geographic location i actually asked mary at some point where wh what city is this supposed to be set in and there was a debate and we discovered that we couldn't exactly determine which city it was supposed to be set in um because there were some hints that it might have been new york but then obviously by the end when they drive out of the city the mountains uh surrounding are clearly somewhere in the western united states um so there's some ambiguity as to the place but um but 
despite the ambiguity as to the place there, the movie is one that has a very good sense of place, you know, um, the sets are very uniformly dark. The color palette is very uniform. Um, and, uh, and things are shot d to definitely show the world as being shitty. Right. Um, and so the question that always I raining in this place, like it is always raining. So the question that I would have for you guys is, um, is the director trying to tell us that the world is shitty, that the truth of the world is that it's shitty? Or are there any scenes that you could point to that give you a sense uh, that there is an idealistic aspect to the way the world is portrayed as well? Well, it, it just occurred to me that, ironically, the, the, the sunniest, the scenes where it's not raining, where it's the brightest and most refreshing are the scene at the end in the desert, which is like the climax of the film. So it's the, it's kind of backwards where, um, no, I'm not going to repeat myself. I just said what I meant. So. Right. Uh, and so this was, it was shot in Los Angeles, like the filming filming locations were Los Angeles. Um, that said, those cabs look very mid nineties, New York cabs to me. Um, it looked a lot like, uh, New York, New York cabs, but yeah, I mean, Antonio, you're right. When they go out into the desert, that's not New Jersey. Um, but there's, there's also a, a mention, Tracy mentions moving upstate or when they lived upstate and that's a very New York thing. So yeah, I, I, I can't quite place exactly what city this is in i kind of i've always sort of assumed new york um because it also rains a lot in new york um during the right during the right seasons um but yeah i mean it's my favorite movie of all time is miller's crossing and i have no idea what city that's set in what uh, what is important is that within the construct of the film that that place is consistent and that place is uh fitting the mood of the film and to to respond to your question i think that literally everybody in this movie hates it like literally everyone in this movie hates the world um and hates the place that they're in so i uh i i can't I can't see any place that is idealized as as a pure good. Um, Jonah, you're right when you're noting the cinematography and that the only sunny place is the place where the wife's head gets delivered. Uh, the only sunny place is the the place where the 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 climactic grossness of uh, the the climactic worst scene in the film. Uh, happens, and so uh, I think that Fincher is trying to uh, trying to convince us of the point of view that each of the characters are taking, and that is that this is a a world without any sort of um, uh, restorative factor. Well, if you look at the entire catalog of David Fincher's films. Um, three come to mind right now panic well the seven panic room and a fight club all those films i mean he he's the kind of director that has such a unique tone it, just by looking at one two one or two frames of his film you can say oh that's a david fincher movie it's just everything is muted even uh, um zodiac which is clearly san francisco uh, they all have like the same dullness that almost makes it feel like it's in the same universe. So um, uh, Fight Club is also an unnamed city. And uh, I, I think that it's more, a lot of it is um, his tone and his brand and the thing that identifies him as a director to give him his own mark than a, uh, a cinema, cinematographic, cinema, you know, um, Cine cinematographic. Thank you. That uh, his, it's not just an artistic decision. It's more. It's it's a marketing decision at the same time. Uh, that that gives it an an unknown 
I'm, I'm talking very slowly today, and I apologize for that. I'm, I'm trying to. It's been a long day. It's so. cool. It's cool. I, I, yeah. I mean, I, I do have to disagree with you because you've got Gone Girl running around there, which is uh, Missouri. Uh, it's set in Missouri, and then it's lit like Missouri um, when it's not in in New York. You've got uh, the Social Network in there, which is uh, uh, part in Boston, part in LA. And uh, yeah, so I, I don't know if I totally agree. It's certainly Fincher. It's mid nineties Fincher, um, and and mid nineties Fincher's aesthetic. Because remember, this is the guy who did the darkest lit, the least lit Alien movie of all time, which is a little surprising considering uh, where we were with Alien Two. Yeah. Um, so. Um, so to, to bring this back around to the, to the idea of, you know, is this world ever depicted in an ideal sense or is it always depicted in this sort of gritty, um, gritty way that suggests that everything is shitty, right? And so both of you have kind of, have, have kind of agreed that the world is definitely visually framed in a way that tells the, us, the viewer, that this is a shitty place, right? Um, and in fact, that the the theme of light and the theme of you know brighter environments is associated with narrative clarity much more than it's associated with any kind of happiness or moral sensibility, right? Um, and so I think that's right on, Antonio. Yeah. And so, totally. the, and so the interesting thing that that this tells us is that the way that the at least vi the movie is visually framed suggests that the idealisms are unequivocally self-deceptive right that that the notion that you can see the world in an ideal way is is put forth by certainly the mills character um and the gwyneth paltrow character to some extent arguably an idealization of the world is put forth to some extent by the john doe character who who suggests that you know there's sort of a way that you can redeem that you can push out of all this crappiness that it's not inherent and the only person who actually believes it's basically human nature is um, William Somerset, right? Somerset, yeah. Um, and so, and so, the way that the movie is visually framed backs up Somerset's interpretation that there is actually no light in the movie. There is no element in the movie where we would say, "Oh, okay, well, that looks really cool. That looks really great. It looks like people are going to be able to have a, a, a tender, sensitive." empathetic good time here there isn't any of that at any point in the movie and so it suggests that both the john doe character and the mills character are not only not only um you know putting forth idealisms that put them in dangerous positions right but they're actually there's there's nothing that they have to go on that would back up their interpretation of the world they are literally just layering bullshit on top of the world in order to survive it and make sense of it and proceed into their next day. Well, yeah, I think you're, uh, go ahead, Jenna. Sorry. No, go, go. Oh, I won't forget what I'm going to say. Okay. Well, I just wanted to sort of add to Antonio's point of view that uh, it also works in the way Fincher frames these characters. Uh, one of the things that was really interesting about our, our podcast a couple weeks ago um, ben was on and he was talking about how when characters are framed on the right side of the frame, it, it um, indicates to the audience that uh, the film is kind of supporting those character point of view, those characters point of views. And when characters enter on the left side, it indicates that the uh, film is, is, uh, is being unsympathetic to those characters' point of views. What's interesting about the way Fincher frames John Doe is he is always center frame. Like in the in the back seat of the car, he is center frame. In the there's another side shot of him that's sort of looking through one of the windows, and he is center framed. So it is as though the film is trying to take a neutral position on John Doe, where it, occasionally it's commenting upon other characters it's sort of uh somerset sometimes is on the right sometimes is on the left uh mills is sometimes on the right sometimes on the left so it's it's e even in its framing according to the uh the thesis that ben posited a couple weeks ago um it's still it's it's playing with 
our sympathies toward these characters and playing with how uh, how full of shit the the film thinks these characters' own self delusions are. Um, whereas whereas Doe, it's just presenting this without much of a comment. Uh, Go ahead, Jonah. I know you were waiting. No, it's no, no problem. I wanted to go back to what Antonio's point about uh, the atmosphere and the and the sunniness of uh, the desert at, in the end. And this is uh, going to sound very strange, but personally, I have a very hard time with bright environments like the wallpapers on my computer are all snow scenes and on my phone it's all like you know snowy mountains because it's just it's cooler and the end the last shots the last frames of the film are so sunny and blown out with lens flares and it's so harsh in the lighting with the sun glaring through the lens it almost it, it's it's uncomfortably hot and it almost feels like they're in hell. If we're gonna go with keep the whole religious tone, I mean, it's it's uncomfortably bright, um, and kind of like the kind that evokes thirst, and like you can feel like the sweat on the back of your neck. If that makes any sense, it's such a bizarre feeling because it's evoking like a like a, a somatic sense almost um, of a uh, that that normally isn't of temperature that's not usually evoked in films usually yeah, it's yeah. sight sound emotion but here it's like you can feel like there's <clears throat> like a tact a tactility to it that uh, definitely was uncomfortable it's it's really interesting that you say that Jonah because um, when I was watching that scene the first thing that came to mind as far as um, like cinematographic parallels um, was to the um, Robin Williams, the 2002 Robin Williams movie Insomnia, if you're familiar with that, um, which is kind of a psychological thriller also um, that plays on how um, the sun doesn't set for several months in some places in the Arctic Circle. And so light is used in a way in that movie that darkness is often used in other sort of thriller or horror movies where it's used as an environmental element that peels away the sanity of the of the protagonists and um i very much felt that light was used in the same kind of way particularly toward the end of seven um where light is something that that peels away uh not only uh you know the obscurity of plot points you know it's not only a revelatory but it also peels away you know hope it's a bleak light it's not merely a it's not merely a light of that that reveals it's also a light that sears to a great extent um and that actually brings brings me to um i guess the the last thing we'll cover before we wrap up is the technical aspects of the movie, which I thought I, I think deserve, a, you know, a, at least a little bit of separate discussion here, um, because this was a movie that has, you know, as Jonah observes, it has a visual style that's so distinctive that you can almost call it a brand, um, you know, that you can say this is what David Fincher mid '90s looked like, you know, it's a it's a look um that that exists maybe not only within this movie but across multiple different products um so uh as we already observed you know the way that the movie is shot sort of reinforces the core cynicism that is at the heart of the movie's message you know the notion that that there isn't any moment in which we can see the world as a tender ideal place that it's always a harsh, dark, you know, place where where light brings severed heads in boxes at best, you know. Um, so uh, something else that I noticed about the movie, and I'll I'll note this and ask you guys what you think it symbolizes, and then sort of toss it out for you guys to discuss any aspects of the cinematography that you really enjoyed or that jumped out to you thematically. Um, something that I noticed was a a significant amount of the movie is shot 
from a very low angle, respectively. Um, a lot of the movie is shot from an angle where you're looking up at the characters' faces, where you're panning around at their feet. Um, and this, I think, is evocative of the sort of infernal aspects of the movie's themes. You know, the notion that this is sort of a descent into hell and we're looking at the shittiness of the world, you know, from a, from a lens that shows the shittiness of the world. So we're actually looking at it almost, it, you know, it, it sort of translates this in a very literal on the nose sense where you're low down, you're looking at it out from out of hell. You're looking at what these people are doing. That's bringing them down into hell ultimately. Um, and so I found that to be a very, a very cool visual trick that the movie pulls that isn't obvious unless you actually are asking yourself, all right, why, why does this shot look distinctive? What looks interesting about this? So, um, do you think, do you agree with that? That's kind of the symbolism here. And then also what aspects of the cinematography particularly stuck out to you guys? Do you want to go first, Jenna? Or? Okay. Or do you want me to? I'll go first. Okay. I have a confession to make. I haven't seen this movie in a few years. I remember it well enough. <laughs> oh, okay. I was like, oh, wow, okay. I remember well enough. I remember distinctly enough and well enough to uh, be able to get, get, get away with the last hour. But I remember the muted colors. There's a few scenes I remember that uh, I could discuss, but... In the in broad strokes, the thing I can talk most about is how dull the dullness of the color palette really evokes the bleakness and the the um, the dryness of the environment they're living in. Everything feels slow and shitty. It's not just evoked through the weather, but evoked um, in. Uh, costume choices in the costume design and the lighting design and just the filters put over the lenses everything felt horrible and like it was moving in slow motion like but um i don't have a specific thing i can point to because uh it's been maybe three years since i've seen the movie but um look okay. man i just want to say i've been where i have a new job i've been working 10 hour days and then i have a two hour drive to work so that's four hours of that's 14 hours of of so i don't really have a lot of um free time no it's so, totally cool, it's really cool. So, yeah so. it's a lot of driving um no i okay uh so i'll do a little uh little bit about uh fincher fincher and his camera uh which which is probably my favorite aspect of watching a fincher film um not you know you you both noted the uh the high angle or the low angle shots for many of the characters i like your uh symbolic interpretation of it antonio i think that works very well we do get some high angles but it's only when they're surveying crime scenes so it's almost as though i i mean to take your we're in hell looking up at the shittiness of the world. There is sort of a godly aspect as we're looking down upon uh, the result of, of these, these awful crimes. Um, that first shot where we're, where we meet the, uh, the gluttony victim, we start low and then we end up high to give us kind of this, uh, this larger frame of the film. Um, one thing that there's a there's a YouTuber named Nerdwriter One, um, which uh, I'm I'm actually copy pasting his uh, uh, his video on Fincher into the chat, which I hope some of us will will take a look at. Um, he he does a fantastic breakdown of how Fincher um, hijack is the quota uh, the the title of the video is how david fincher hijacks your eyes and he's very careful about when blocking a scene to include the camera in the blocking so that each movement that a character makes is mirrored by the camera um that every like if i were to 
to lift up this beer bottle and then the, the camera were to start focusing on the beer bottle, the camera would move in perfect synchronicity with the beer bottle toward my mouth. And that is a, it's a hypnotic, it's way, it's a way that he creates this hypnotic feeling to his films. And I think seven has a, has an incredibly hypnotic feel to it. Um, each tracking shot is almost perfectly in line with the characters as they're walking. And some of his framing with uh, each shot has incredible depth of field that we we're getting characters and, and focal points in, in both the fore foreground and in the background and, and then the scenery behind them. Each shot is perfectly composed. Um, while so I, I think you nailed the thematic uh, interpretation of some of the cinematography, I'm, trying to uh, to suggest that he's a master technician when it comes to hijacking our intention because everything is so yeah. so uniquely synchronistic. Well, looking up at, uh, real quick, looking up at um, the gluttony guy, we're also looking down, like on the sloth, like we're looking down on them, like as if we're better than them. So um, there's also the, the camera, in a way becomes a voice of uh, emotion to look down on someone is to look at that down with them in descent not just to perceive them but to uh so the camera angle itself becomes emotive okay that's i'm done good night yeah i i i completely agree with you that the camera in this in this work much more than most other movies is a uh, is sort of a propagandistic tool as much as any lines in the movie you know the way that the uh, shots are framed um the color palette that's used um and actually that's one of the things that i thought was really uh nifty about this movie was um and this again is is one of the things that that personally appeals to me about the movie is that um it's an incredibly violent movie if you think about what is actually being described, the events that are actually being described by the narrative. But if you actually consider what shows up on camera, it's very, very little in terms of what you actually see that is going to make this going to gross you out. It's an incredibly gross movie that does it very, very subtly from a visual standpoint. You don't actually see much of the bottom line that ends up being evoked and described to you as a viewer. Um, and I really enjoy this approach because one of the, you know, as, as someone from a very literary background, um, one of the core beliefs that I have is that um, the human imagination is capable of filling in m a lot more gaps than direct, uh, direct exposition a lot of the time. And so I love that this movie takes the very a very subtle approach with its violence, where it's really a hyper 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 violent movie. If you think about what ends up being done to the people in the movie, but the actual amount, the percentage of that that shows up on camera is like maybe maybe you know two three percent of of the actual violence that ends up being described, um, and that means that makes it super freaky to us. You know, you uh, with with something as subtle as just a dude on a bed just like waking up can be like one of the freakiest scenes in in cinema history just like oh my fucking god what is happening there you know um and similarly you know showing the the bandaged face of of the pride victim with the verbal description of what exactly went into all that you know you see all you see is a pill bottle in one hand a phone in the other and then some bloody bandages over her face and you go, Oh shit. Oh, that's what happened to her. Oh dude. You know? Um, and so I love how much the violence in this movie is evoked rather than directly described. Um, and I think that's one of the ways in which this movie is very visually successful um, with just very couple tight framings of a couple body parts and, a couple reaction shots and the right audio cues, you can re you can get a sense of a of a you know of a murder most foul that you could never actually show on camera with 
the same kind of visceral impact. Yeah, I think you're right, but it's at the same time that gluttony victim is one of the most disgusting things, yeah, that I've seen on film. Same thing with the uh, the sloth victim. Those two, ooh, those two are tough. Um, so, do we want to roll into our uh, final thoughts, or uh, yes, do you want to? Good moment to segue into into the wrap up. I think we've covered all the the important elements and uh, hashed and out the big. You debate. you have a box there, Jonah. Or yeah. what, what's the? Uh, what's in tell me what's in the box. What's in the box? Oh, uh, well, cool. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, your mic's still muted. <laughs> so, so you're. No, I, saw, uh, I got nothing. I got nothing. Okay. Yeah, there was a, uh, there was sort of a, for our listeners, what's going on here is there is, there is now a, what is now aborted segment. Um, Noah sent, sent me an email that said, uh, for the podcast tomorrow, bring a small box and place in it something that represents a vice of yours. We'll, we'll be having a what's in your box, what's in the box segment. And yet, uh, that in that that email wasn't sent to Antonio, and uh, apparently it was sent to Jonah, but he just put his middle finger in it. So I do have my box. It's not small. It was literally the hardest thing today to find a box in my house, because uh, because I don't keep boxes for some fucking reason. I guess I don't know. Um, and what's in my box is a, a pack of cigarettes. So I guess that's my vice. My my sin is gluttony. And I also put my phone in there because I have slothed more hours uh, on the on fucking apps on that phone than anything else. So I think gluttony and sloth are my two what's in the, are two things that are in the box. Um, so that's mine. And apparently yours is wrath because yours was a middle finger. No, mine, um, mine is self loathing and hatred. Okay, so yeah, we'll call that wrath. <laughs> and uh, Antonio, and well, now I'm going to put you in the spot and say what yeah. would be in your box were you to have a box. Well, since I don't have any box and I'm just kind of sitting here uh, pleased with myself, um, I'm assuming that my sin would be per, uh, sloth. Uh, or pride because or you're pride. so free. Uh, good for a box, yeah. Yeah. Be also. Um, so let's uh, let's wrap up here and get our closing thoughts on the film as well as you know our, our ratings. And remember, the way we do things here usually is we give a score of X out of 10 um, for both the how much we personally like the movie and then also X out of 10 for how much the movie is scary or freaky or whatever interpretation of giving you the willies uh, you personally accept. So let's start with uh, with Jonah. Wrap up your thoughts on the movie and uh, and tell tell us uh, how scary you thought it was and how okay. much. You liked it. I have already given. I'm not going to repeat myself uh, in terms of what my thoughts are. I think in terms of fear factor, um, I'll say like four because the scenes that do disturb me push it that high, like the you know detective, detective, detective screaming scene. But outside of that, I'd say it's like a two. Um, but in terms of just overall, how good is the movie? I'd give it nine and a half. It's uh, it's it's a four on the scare scale and a nine on the overall scale, right? Sure. Yeah. Cool. All right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. So I do. Uh, uh, I'll. I, I do five star scales normally, but I can translate that to a 10. Um, this is a four star film for me. Um, we use the metric system here. So you have to use the 10. I have to, I have to convert to the metric system. So it's a, it's a four out of five. So an eight out of 10 uh, for me. And that's uh, the, the one star off, I guess. I don't really think of it that way, but uh, I, I, as I said before, I think that the Gwyneth Paltrow character, the Tracy, sort of becomes a a girl in the refrigerator. That old um, trope uh, that the uh, the woman has to die once again. We get hashtag feminist our our feminist uh, interpretation. Um, 
the the fact that the woman has to die and she becomes the motivating force for the male character that's a trope that that uh that bothers me slightly and so that's that's the reason i give it a four out of five but in praising the film i think that the i the idealism versus cynicism and logic versus emotion um dichotomy really resonates for me um that's the the central dichotomy in in my favorite film miller's crossing so I, the fact that that's in seven two that's right where that's right in my happy zone um so i am i am really into that that dichotomy and that debate being played out on film and i think that it plays out in incredibly felt compelling fashion in this film I am compelled by both characters. I don't think either character is necessarily, both characters, uh, Somerset and Mills, I don't think either character is set up deliberately by the film to be sort of a, 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 a scare, what am I thinking of? Um, where you set up an argument, somebody help me with this, where you set up an argument as straw man, thank you. I, for some reason, I was thinking Scarecrow. Uh, the, neither of those characters are set up to be straw man arguments. I think they're both fully realized um, signifiers of of logic and signifiers of emotion. And I think they're they're three dimensional. Um, I find that to be really compelling. And uh, as we as I sort of transition into the uh, the gross factor of this film. Um, this film is really gross uh, in in parts. I I've said before about the gluttony and the sloth victims. I think those are fantastic. I think you're also right, Antonio, when you talk about the other victims where we don't fully see uh, what happens to them. And for that reason, I'm giving it a seven out of ten uh, on the scare factor. And uh, so those are my thoughts about the film. I think it's I think it's fantastic and a high recommend. Uh, go ahead, Antonio. Why don't you close us out? So um, the horror movies that that tend to be my favorite are, you know, the slow burns with uh, big twists and and crazy reveals at the end. Um, the uh, the two other films that I've uh, most prominently suggested for this podcast so far have been um, the Wicker Man, which obviously is a very similar sort of uh, missing persons mystery that burns very slowly and you know the protagonist ends up finding himself seduced by the uh, machinations of the villain by the end in a similar kind of fashion to how it plays out here in seven um also really like alien which again you know is a fairly slow burning movie where you don't exactly know where it's going to go until it finally gets there um and uh so a, a, a fantastic example of the genre, um, plenty freaky. Uh, the things that I particularly appreciate about the movie are, you know, as I said, the Judeo-Christian symbolism, um, the the level of intelligence in the in the crafting of the storyline. It's quite intricate, and as we've seen tonight, there's a number of different ways you can splice it and weight it to get different sorts of messages, and. For a movie this tightly plotted to admit that many different sorts of interpretations is just a wonderful thing. Um, it's exactly what you want in a good work of art. It is something where the core meaning is fairly clear, the core themes are fairly clear, but you can still have all kinds of discussion around the periphery. Um, weak aspects of the movie, I think Jim honestly probably has summed them up better than I could. Um, you know, namely that the the Gwyneth Paltrow character and, you know, the female voice in general doesn't have much of a role in the movie except as a fairly tropey, cliche, motivating factor. Um, and uh, other than that, though, the movie hits its story beats very, very clearly, um, maybe a little thin on the connection between the esoteric literary material and the plot, but that's so peripheral that it doesn't affect my overall enjoyment of the movie at all. Um, qualitatively, I'd probably give this movie an eight and a half out of 10. Um, just very strong example of the genre, beautiful movie, definitely a movie you could rewatch and look for uh, themes that you missed the first time. Um, and uh, as far as the freaky factor of this movie, 
um, as I've said to viewers before, um, I don't get scared in the traditional sense with movies, but I do find that certain movies are very unsettling. And as far as unsettling goes, this one is way, way up at the top there. Um, almost all the victims in this movie have some aspect of irony and tragedy where you can sort of reflect on what happened to them a long time after you're done with the movie and be disquieted by it. You know, gluttony being, you know, die, dying from being force fed is super freaky. You know, sloth being, you know, uh, paralyzed on that bed for months and months and months is super freaky. Um, the horrible choice that's presented to the pride uh, victim is super freaky. So these are all things that will haunt you a long time after you're done with the movie. So as far as freaky factor, I, I would also give it an eight and a half out of 10 for as being something that is quite disquieting that achieves a very unnerving effect uh, with a minimum of screen time and exposition um, and rubbing your nose in it. It lets your brain do most of the work. And I love that about this movie. Um, so uh, with that, I guess we'll, that, that wraps up this particular episode of Deadly Analysis. Um, I think Jim has a teaser for next episode. Is that right, Jim? Yes, that's correct. Uh, ne we're, right now, we're currently scheduled for next week, Peeping Tom. Um, so we will be on Sunday, the 21st, on Peeping Tom. Uh, that may change as a result of uh, Noah's, uh, Noah's schedule. So stay tuned to our social media, um, at Deadly Analysis on Twitter, and uh, we will update you. Uh, you could also follow me on Twitter at JT Hunter. Uh, 13 and I will I will be retweeting any of uh, any of the scheduling changes as uh, as Noah communicates them to to the rest of us. Um, we are uh, to answer a question in the chat. We are available on Apple Podcasts. We're also available on SoundCloud and of course if you're watching here on YouTube, we're available here on YouTube. Uh, so we will uh, we will look forward to uh, 19 si a discussion of 1960s Peeping Tom on the next episode episode of Deadly Analysis next week. Uh, do you want to close this out, Antonio? Sure thing. All right, guys. Thanks for watching. We will see you next week or in a couple of weeks. I guess we'll find out. <laughs> Probably next week, but uh, we'll 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 keep you updated on our social media. Uh, thanks everybody. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching and stay creepy. Bye, guys.